Straight to the Market, in conjunction with Frontpage presents to you Facebook posts by Strive Masiwa, read by Marvelin Kihara. Being Business Minded, Part 1. One of the fastest growing businesses in the world today is a company called Uber. For those who do not know what Uber is, it is essentially a mobile app, a computer program using a cell phone, which makes it possible for you to call a taxi. Uber does not own taxis. Uber does not own any taxis or cars of its own. The app sends a message, similar to an SMS, to the nearest registered but independent Uber driver within your vicinity. The car will usually arrive at your location within five minutes. Whilst using one of these services, the owner of the car proudly told me that he was making a lot of money as the service brings him customers. Uber takes a commission and also does the billing. All he has to do is turn up. Then the driver added this. Uber has no assets, just some computer servers. Seeing that he was a smart entrepreneur, I then engaged him in a wider conversation about business. I asked him so many questions that he finally asked me, are you planning to set up a similar business in Africa? Not really, I'm just business minded. I make it my business to see the business side of any business. I then surprised him by telling him what I already knew about Uber. For instance, I told him that Uber is now valued at more than $40 billion. They are more valuable than Anglo-American, which is one of the largest mining companies in the world. Imagine a taxi hailing service is more valuable than Anglo, which has been around for more than 100 years employs tens of thousands of people and controls some of the largest depots of diamonds, platinum, iron ore, and coal in the whole world. Do you think that is fair? The Uber driver asked. How can a company with no assets be worth more than a mining company that owns De Beers diamonds or Anglo platinum? Uber has no assets. They do not even own the cell phone network on which their services operate. Who would have imagined that someone can come along and change a service as simple as getting a taxi? $40 billion. As we neared the end of my journey, I suddenly asked my driver, who incidentally was an African from Ethiopia, how does Facebook and Twitter make money? Through advertising, he shot back. What does that mean? I asked laughing. Not really sure, sir. I laughed some more, and as I got out of this car, I was still laughing. He looked bewildered by my response. Sadly, I did not have a chance to explain to him why I was laughing. He rushed to his next Uber client. I went my way, still laughing. Being Business Minded Chapter 1, Part 2 I will never forget the first time we had to deal with BlackBerry when they produced their phone for the first time. Our business model is quite simple the sales executive said to us, we charge you $20 per customer per month and you can charge on top whatever you want. My chief marketing officer who was dealing with them was livid. This is ridiculous. We have invested billions of dollars to build the network and to get customers. Now you walk in here and tell us that you will get the lion's share of the revenue on each customer? How can anyone accept such an arrangement? The Blackberry guy smiled and said quietly, it's a take it or leave it. The matter was escalated up to me as chairman. I listened quietly to our senior executives express with their frustrations and indignation. That means we will only get about $5 whilst they take $20. Is that fair? Why? Why can't they just sell us phones like everyone else? Why do they want a revenue share as though they are the operators? Do it and do it now, I said quietly. Then I explained. They have the upper hand. They know that they have an iconic product, which our top customers will want. If we do not sign, they can do serious damage to a business by handing this opportunity to a competitor. This game is no longer about building networks. It's the guys who can use our networks for their own businesses. That will be king from now on. We better learn to do the same or at least work with them. 
the position of BlackBerry would remain unchallenged until someone came along with a better product, and that was Apple. They were even more aggressive about what they wanted. There was no debate. We all understood by then. Today, Apple is worth more than $600 billion, making it the most valuable company in history. Yes, more valuable than any oil company or mining conglomerate or cell phone company. Being business-minded requires you to understand what I call changing dispositions when they occur. If you do not understand why Alibaba, an online flea market, is worth more than any cell phone company or any mining company, you will not be able to play the business game. Now think about Uber and learn to be business-minded. Being business-minded, chapter one, part three. Being business-minded, change is coming to your business. In the last post, I made a comment about what I called a changing dispensation. And many of you were quite intrigued by this and asked me to explain. Whenever I share a little story, my key objective is to help you extract one or two principles that you can apply when you find yourself in such a situation. For instance, I gave the story of BlackBerry. Until they came along, our business model as a mobile network operator was to buy phones in bulk as cheaply as possible and sell them to our customers. Our business was not to sell phones, but to get people to use them. Our business was airtime. Now here was a new manufacturer, BlackBerry, who did not want to just sell us phones, but wanted a share of the airtime revenue. Actually, they wanted the majority of the airtime revenue. I realized very quickly that they were not selling a phone, but a service. BlackBerry is not a phone. It's a phone used to access the internet. It was the first real smartphone. The game had changed. New dispensation. Companies like Nokia and Motorola, who had dominated the game until then, were in big, big trouble. If they did not see this, change in dispensation. Nokia failed to see this change and were taken to the cleaners. Giant companies like Ericsson's of Sweden, Siemens of Germany shut down their cell phone manufacturing businesses and fled at the coming of smartphone. Boys like Samsung and Apple. Others just became small-time players in an industry they had once dominated. Changing dispensation. I also realized at that point that we would have to change quickly and turn our attention to things like mobile money services. Now, we would have to hire bankers and insurance people, even doctors. Yes, we have medical doctors developing products. This was at a time when there was no Google, Twitter, Skype, Facebook, Alibaba, or WhatsApp. We would have to reach out to these new players and find ways to work with them or get rolled over. Extract a principle now. It does not matter what industry you're in or how well established it looks. Somewhere, somewhere, there is someone working on something that will completely turn it upside down. Uber is changing the public transport industry of taxis. Amazon took on the distribution of books. Netflix and similar services will smash the traditional TV broadcasters and pay TV companies. Being business-minded is accepting this reality. It is something that should actually excite you. I get goose pimples. I love it. Another principle. In 1900, if a young man or woman went to the most successful person around and said, what business should I be in to really be successful? The answer would not be the same when asked in 2000. And it would not be the same if asked in 2050. There are different dispensations. You should not be dreaming of being a rural bus operator. It's not a business of your dispensation. There are new industries being developed every day at an ever-increasing pace. Being business-minded, chapter one, part four. Being business-minded, Uber, EcoCash, or M-Pesa are just the same. One of my young daughters, intrigued by what I said in my first post on being business-minded, asked me, so how does a mobile money service like EcoCash or M-Pesa actually work? It works just like Uber? I replied. How? She asked, surprised. Like Uber, they use a very sophisticated software platform to link up key partners in the transaction process. Uber relies on independent drivers 
who own the cars and actually carry the people. Our mobile money service, EcoCash, relies on thousands of independent small businesses who handle the actual transactions. If you think about it, the principles used in these two systems are exactly the same. Uber works as a unique partnership with the drivers. Mobile money transfers systems works as a unique partnership with thousands of small businesses. She stopped and reflected for a moment then asked, do you think there are other partnerships out there that can use this Uber eco cash type principle? The opportunities are actually limitless. You just have to be business minded to find them. Why don't you think of other services which could be developing? The opportunities are actually limitless. You just have to be business minded to find them. Why don't you think of other services which could be developed using the same principle? Being business minded is not just about creating new products or services, but sometimes it is about bringing disruptive new ideas to existing products and services. And if you come up with a great idea, be smart. Don't go telling the whole world on Facebook, just do it. In Business Minded, Chapter 1, Part 5. Being Business Minded, Witty Inventions. Proverbs, Chapter 8, Verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. Chido is one of my Facebook fans. She reads every post and follows up with my afterthoughts taking copious notes and extracting principles. One day, she decided to visit her grandmother, who lived in a village about 400 kilometers from the capital city of her country. She would have to travel there by bus or catch a lift from someone going to the area. The challenge for her was that the bus could be very intermittent and never really followed a particular schedule. And as for the guys with lifts, she was afraid she might get someone who could harm her. Anyway, she would have to brave it, because that is the way it had always been. Only this time, as she sat in the rickety rural bus, she was thinking about something I had said in one of my posts. She was thinking about Uber. In her own research, she had discovered that the guy who set up Uber set it up because he could not get a taxi when he needed it. Why can't we Uber ease rural transport? She asked herself. Imagine if I could get an SMS 30 minutes before the bus was getting close to my village instead of waiting all day. She had also read on the internet about the Uber carpool system and she thought to herself, if the guys who offer others a lift were on an Uber-like system, I would have a better chance of vetting who gives me a lift and when they are available. Why doesn't some African entrepreneur come up with a system similar to Uber to solve our own transport problems? Surely, it must be possible to adapt the software they use for our challenges here in Africa. Returning from visiting her grandmother, Chido had to wait almost the whole day by the side of the road, trying to get a lift back to town. As usual, it was a harrowing experience for the young woman. Finally, she managed to squeeze herself into the back of a truck driven by a drunkard who almost killed them. The following day, she called a young friend, whom she often met at the internet cafe, and she asked him a question, James, you know how to write in code, don't you? I have internet friends all over Africa, and even as far as India, who could help us develop something like this? It actually is not difficult, James declared confidently. The two of them reached out to some internet friends using social media and began to develop their idea. Very soon, they had a company with partners in Nigeria, Kenya, India, and America. When their company listed on their New York Stock Exchange a few years later, they were richer than Aliko Dangote, principal. Chido and James do not have to be imaginary characters. There are young people across the entire world who have skills to solve this kind of problem, and many others like them. They do not need to buy buses to get into business, but they will end up making more money than any business operator in history. They will be able to get into business with far less capital than needed. Be business conscious. Be business minded. This is your dispensation. Being business minded. Chapter 1, Part 6. Being business minded. So who is making the money? A friend of mine in South Africa 
wanted me to join him in acquiring a business called A Feeding Lot. Something he said intrigued me. We have 50,000 cattle on one farm. Did you say 50,000 cattle? Wow, I have never seen that many cattle in one place. I have to see this, I exclaimed with excitement. Having walked around the farm and seeing all these cattle feeding in one place was pretty cool. And for a city slicker like me, it would be great to have the bragging rights of saying I have 50,000 cattle. I could just see how they would react back in my village in Zimbabwe. But before I got carried away, I had to look at the numbers. And when I look at the numbers, I look at numbers. How do they make money and how much? Let me get this. I asked the managing director of the operation. You buy the cattle from other farmers and then you feed them. Then you sell them to the guy who slaughters them and he sells them to the supermarkets? Yes. Interesting. So who makes the money? It's an industry. Tell me about this industry. I want to know everything about it. The management were professional and passionate about their business. It was clear they had been in it all their lives. Most of them had specialist agricultural degrees and MBAs. The more they spoke, the more I realized how sophisticated it all was. There is a science to everything. Now the guy was talking about the type of cattle they use, how they got the cattle to put on weight quickly, disease control, competitors from Brazil. Wow, they do that? Yes, yes, yes. I see. I wondered what the conversation with a professional farmer would have sounded like. Or for that matter, the abattoir operator or the buyer of the supermarket chain. Respect, respect. Being business minded requires you to always approach things with humility and respect. There is nothing out there that is simple. Only fools look at what someone else is doing and say to themselves, that is simple. The process of reviewing their financial statements and business operations took me several months working with industry consultants. It was harder than a telecommunications business. I decided not to buy the business, although I would have gladly invested for a minority stake on condition that they have stayed to run it. Understanding this distinction will prepare you for the senior class of business-minded people. Being business-minded, chapter one, part seven. Being business-minded, there is space for you to play. In my last post, I talked about my efforts to buy a 50,000 cattle business called a feedlot. I spent a lot of time studying the business and the industry in which it operated. I read tons and tons of documents and studies and also spoke to as many experts as I could. And even then, I never got a place to comfort about my knowledge of it. I needed a few more years to understand such a complex business. So I did not buy it even though I might have invested in it for just a small stick, but not for control. Unfortunately, this was an opportunity to buy the whole business and take control. Principles. One, superficial understanding is not enough. Don't trash off based on one hour search on the internet. You have to dig really deep. I would have done this even if I had offered an opportunity to buy a chicken rearing business. Number two. There is a big difference in the knowledge you need to buy a controlling stake in business and the knowledge to invest for a small stake. I can bring myself up to speed to invest and have a small stake in almost any business, but it requires much more knowledge to own and operate a business in any industry. Many people have been banned because they did not understand this difference. It explains why someone can be a great investor in a business run by others, but when that person takes over a business to run it, they fail completely. These are profoundly different issues. Number three, respect. Always approach anything you have not done before with deep respect and humility. It's what positions you to learn what you need to learn. King David, speaking of those who scoff, those who are dismissive of the things they don't understand, stay away from such people. They are doomed to failure. He was a wise king. Number four, motive. 
The fact that a business is a good business and the fact that it's in a good industry does not mean it's a good business for you personally. I see many business opportunities, much more than you could ever imagine. Nine times out of 10, I refer them to someone that I think I best qualified for. I always, always want to check my motive. I don't want to go into a business for the purpose of bragging to others. There's always space for you to play, but approach it with diligence. A great king once said, Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy hearts. Chapter 2 From Employee to Player Part 1 Whenever someone describes themselves as a worker, it really grates on my tooth. It is really a word that does not suit the current best practice. I'm also uncomfortable with the word employee. Can you imagine Cristiano Ronaldo describing himself as an employee of Real Madrid Football Club? Or LeBron James describing himself as a worker of Cleveland Cavaliers? People would just laugh at you. Technically, it might be correct that they are contracted as, an, as any employee or worker because they don't own the clubs. But we all know they are much more than that. They are the heart and soul of the organization. Yes, they are the directors and CEOs behind the scenes, but a club is what it is because of these stars. In this next series, I'm going to talk about why talent matters in the workplace and that ultimately it's the battle for talent and skills that will decide whether your organization will be a success and ultimately whether your country will succeed to deliver prosperity for you in the 21st century. There's no problem that will arise in your business that cannot be solved. If you have access to the right talent and skills, nothing, absolutely nothing. The days of employees and workers are over. In future, when you meet someone, you will not say to them, where do you work? But what do you play for? There will be no such thing as human resource manager or personal manager. These are archaic concepts belonging to a bygone age when mostly men were employed to use their hands. We will instead talk of talent managers. Just as every fan of a good sports team writes about the recruitment of talented players to a team, so will those associated with businesses. It's all about talent and skills. Chapter 2. Employee to Player. Part 2. We had been negotiating with our partners all day. The situation was desperate and tempers were frayed. I don't like to raise my voice, but these guys were driving me crazy with their unreasonableness. We were getting nowhere. Then one of my team members, a young lawyer, whispered in my ear, why don't we ask for time out for 20 minutes? I looked at him quite surprised. I have an idea which can help break the long jam. Almost irritated by his impertinent interjection, I agreed to take a short break. What is your idea? I asked him. Can we take a walk outside? I agreed. More out of the need for fresh air than the fact that this youngster could have an idea that could change this difficult situation. We stepped out, the two of us, into the humid African night. My suggestion is that you step out of the negotiations and allow me to take over. I was stunned by his proposal, but I listened. 20 minutes later, I appointed him lead negotiator and left the room. I put everything in his hands and pulled all the other top executives out. Through the night and most of the following day, he continued with the negotiations. In the evening, he brought me a final draft for signing. I signed. It remains to this day one of the most important agreements I have ever signed. It's worth hundreds of millions of dollars to our group. Over the years, there have been attempts to overturn it in international courts and arbitrations, but it has stood solid. The young man is now a near 20-year veteran in our group, running one of our most important companies. If you went to Bill Gates or any other great entrepreneur, they will have similar stories of people in their organizations. We need to move away from the notion of workers and employers. We need to embrace passionately that successful businesses can be just like successful professional sports club. 
So let me ask a personal question. If your company were a soccer team, where would you be? In the starting 11 or on the bench? A player does not beg anyone for a job. It's up to you. Make the decisions today that make you a player that can change the direction of the game and the destiny of the team. In my next post, I will talk about how you become a player rather than an employee. Chapter 2. Employee to Player. Part 3. Access to the right talent and skills. You will notice in this series I have repeatedly used the word access to talent and skills. When a business is small or just starting out, it is extremely difficult to hire the best people that are available because you may not be able to offer job security that people are looking for, or you just might not be as prestigious as the well-established businesses. You must do your best, even if it means offering them an opportunity to own shares to compensate for the risk they are taking in joining you. Number one, you have to be convinced that talent and skills matter. The first thing that you have to do is to have a conviction in yourself that talented and skilled people are important to you. Some people will hire people simply for window dressing. You have to begin with a deep respect of what you can achieve if you have access to the right people. Number two, make the pool in which you look as big as possible. Once you're ready to bring in the best skills you can find in your community or country, you must be willing to embrace diversity because at the very least, it makes your talent pool very big. Don't focus on hiring relatives and classmen. Don't exclude women and people of other races and religions. Increasing the size of your talent pool also requires particular focus on helping young people acquire work experience through you. So many of our best people were first spotted while still at school or as school leavers working on odd jobs for us. You do not have to be big before you do this. You just don't exploit them, but pay them and help them. Go on to further education. Number three, access includes the people who advise you. You may not be able to offer employment to the best qualified people, but you must be a person who values professional advisors. And if you're not willing to pay for the advice, it's worthless. Be a person who enjoys getting the views of the best people out there. There are many people in our organization who are began as outside advisors. But when we became bigger, I was able to get them to join full time. Number four, value the talent and skills in your organization. Some people are afraid to acknowledge those who are talented and skilled because they think it will make them big-headed and lead to unreasonable demands. To the contrary, when people feel valued and appreciated, it increases their commitment to an organization and the vision of its leaders. Number five, encourage the people who already work for you to develop themselves. Encourage them to go back to school whenever possible. Encourage them to take up courses and give them support. Employee to player. Part four. Starting or investing in a business back home. Five things you need to consider before starting. People who work and live in the diaspora are some of the hardest working people in the world. Sometimes they work on more than one job at a time. Many of them like to save money and start something at home whilst others are simply looking for an investment opportunity which can give them a good return. If you're thinking of either starting a business back home or investing in an existing business, number one, be clear about your motive. The first thing you must be clear about in your mind is the motive behind your decision. Some of the motives behind a decision to invest back home include the following. The need to reduce the burden of constantly sending money home. Creating an opportunity for you to return home. Creating a nest egg for when you retire and return home. Getting a better return than what you think you can get where you are. Hey, 
I'm not here to judge your motive. All that I want you to know is that understanding your own motive and being honest about it will have a big role in the strategy you adopt and can be the difference between success and failure, along with so many other things I have spoken about before. Not every motive requires the same strategy for success. Some motives can lead to serious problems if you're not careful. Two, how much time do you have to spend on it? It's extremely important for you to have an honest assessment from the very beginning about how much time you can spend tending to the business back home. You have to always bear in mind that your current job or jobs demand a lot of time. You might also be far away in a country with different time zones or where it's difficult to travel from a short notice if there's a crisis in the business. Knowing how much time you're able to spend will help you evaluate the timing of the decision to start a business and most importantly, the type of business you should do. Three, do your homework about the business environment back home. Prepare a proper business plan. Study the market carefully. Don't rush, be methodical. Remember you worked hard for the money. Four, it always pays to get advice from others. Talk to others in their diaspora who are in business. Ask deep searching, well-researched questions. Talk to other business people back home. Don't rush, be methodical. Remember you worked hard for this money. Five, who is going to look after the business? You have worked hard for the money, so be careful and diligent about who you give responsibility for the running the day-to-day -day affairs of the business. Don't mix up the need to have someone loyal with the need to have someone competent. Handing over your hard-earned money to an unemployed cousin simply because you trust him has left many people in tears. It's important to be professional about how you go about choosing someone to look after the venture even if it's a relative. Should you start a business or just buy shares in an existing business? This is something you must decide first. Straight to the Market, in conjunction with Frontpace, presents to you Facebook posts by Strive Masiwa, read by Marvelin Kihara, by Marvelin Kihara, by